Hello listeners and welcome to the Motto Weekly Podcast, bringing you energy matters in an informal setting. In today's pod, we return to the topic of power purchase agreements or PPAs. What has been the impact of high and then low prices on these types of deals over the past few months? And what has been the impact of recent regulatory proposals on the PPA sector? What are the options available to companies, developers, off-takers and utilities? So what's the best option? Use a forward market, auctions, contracts for difference and or PPAs, or perhaps a mixture of all of the above. Helping me, Richard Sverson, to discuss this and the outlook for the PPA sector is Luca Pedretti of Pexapark. A warm welcome to you, Luca. Very good to have you back on. Hi, Richard. It's great to be back with you. Thanks. Excellent. So I think we could start off by looking at this, sort of summarizing the PPA market so far this year. Uh, what's happened? I, I think you also, in a recent report, you talked about the golden age of PPAs. Maybe you could go into more detail there. Yeah, let's start. I mean, we had Q1 just absolutely smashed all the records uh, to me a bit unexpectedly. But we can dive into that. So we recorded almost six gigawatts of PPAs just in Q1 in Europe. Now, just to put that in perspective, we that 60% of the deal count of uh, last year. And when you remember, we talked about last year in a, in a previous session how difficult the year was with the price volatility, with uh, the, the surge in price, with the issues on the liquidity, and then this wave of regulatory interventions uh, with the revenue caps, uh, we wouldn't have expected to rebound that much, but actually there is more on the horizon and that's what we call the golden age of PPAs. In terms of the outlook for the full year, do you expect then to um, double or whatever? You've got, if you've already reached 60%, what, 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 um, what do you forecast for this year? Absolutely. I mean, it's absolutely within good likelihood to see a doubling of the market, uh, but much more I won't lean out of the, the window as the market is, uh, let's say, there is instability in the market. I mean, we will see how winter will go. Everyone is right now relaxed uh, due to prices coming down, but the overall system is short on gas and it wouldn't take much that you would have some price disruptions. But at least uh, we don't, it's a positive mood. It's a very good start. There is huge interest in green energy. Basically there's a lack of green energy. So industrials would just fly over to contract. And, and this is actually for me, the big topic of the day is we see a complete different regulatory mood. I mean, when we look at last year, it was just bad after bad after bad interventions. We had this revenue cap in many countries and investors just stood, stood back and didn't want to invest and just wanted to wait. And there was always the discussion, what will come next? Will it be extended? Uh, will it be graver? And this is very uh, not helpful for... Uh, for not conducive for an investment situation. And this has completely changed. And I see that some of these temporary moves are you know, being cancelled. Um, is, there, is there a danger that they could return? I mean, you talked about some of the instability uh, for the months ahead. You know, that there is, we are still very short of gas, you know, so, uh, and the all eyes are on the next winter. We were quite lucky with the mild weather the last winter, but is there a chance that these could make a comeback. You know, yeah, these absolutely. Here. But that's market induced. Yeah. So we have in certain markets, we have quite some topics on capture rate. We have low liquidity. We, we maybe have spiking prices, but this is market reality and we can deal with that. I think what has gone away is the regulatory uncertainty in sense of there will be radical interventions. And I think this is what is really opening the golden age of PPA. Maybe we can dive into this topic. So what I'm really relieved and many in the industry is there's no radical changes ahead. I mean, we discussed and also on your podcast, moving away from marginal pricing and other radical uh, interventions. This is off the table for now. It takes much more time to do such things, which is the most important piece. So what currently the European Commission is proposing is a soft reform. There will be no change to the fundamental uh, market design, and most importantly, no extension of the revenue caps. That's just, 
the great settings. And then we see further supportive measures uh, which are planned on the PPA market. So, I mean, let, let's talk a little bit about the regulatory proposals that came from the Commission I- in March. I mean, uh, what was your response to them, Luca? Well, uh, first of all, it was a big document to read. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. But uh, thanks to the team, uh, I, I was actually really struck because I, I didn't pay much attention. And then uh, I saw from our analysis team the summary and it was late night and I read through this summary and I was just taken aback because I didn't follow it so closely. So I think there are three big pillars uh, which are being proposed, which will usher in uh, a golden age for PPAs first. It is uh, this complementary view of CFD and PPA. Uh, so uh, the Europe Commission proposes that all support schemes shall be structured as two-way CFDs. That means there will be no more extra profits if prices shoot up uh, to investors, which is great. It's it's a very clear system. So that means for investors seeking an alternative, some different structure, some more exposure, they do the PPA. But it's not just that. It is also possible now, or as a rule, principle, that you can just allocate a certain capacity to a CFT and you can market the rest on the open market. Maybe you do to top up a five-year PPA, seven-year or 10, or maybe you just do 20% in the CFT or 80%, whatever your risk profile. So this basically quadruples the PPA market. We roughly had 25% realized in PPA, 75% on CFTs, and now you open those systems to work together. That's beautiful. Then the second thing is credit support for industrials. I mean, this is the biggest stumbling block to increase the addressable demand side for PPAs on uh, on the market. This is what we see as the key stumbling blocks. Now, we have a thousand terawatts of industrial demand roughly in Europe. There are some segments growing tremendously like data centers, uh, but roughly there's a thousand terawatts in classical industrial demand. And the good credit more or less is already addressed. Now, uh, if there will be credit support, and this can be organized in very market-friendly terms, there's the geek system in uh, in Norway used to, uh, that there has just been a deal announced in Spain by Sonatix using a similar facility uh, from the export agency, credit agency in Spain to support an industrial uh, offtake. I mean, this will unlock a huge amount of additional PPAs. Of course, this might take a year or two to realize uh, how those systems will be set up. I'm just painting the picture how additional demand can be can be unlocked. And there is a third thing from Acer Moore where they want to create, uh, yeah, additional liquidity, which is of course. Uh, super nice. They want to create uh, virtual trading hubs connected with transmission rights. It's just for me very hard to see how liquidity can be created top down. Liquidity is a tricky beast. You cannot command traders uh, to go there and everything has to be right. Yeah, you need ample supply and demand to converge. Risk appetite must be there. Uh, So I I think it will work different. I think it's a noble idea. I think the it has to be sorted by the market. So I think the future is more that market participants will be agreeing to a few set of reference prices for PPAs. And then you will start to trade around that uh, like it has happened in other markets. Uh, but you know what? The best driver of liquidity is more PPA transactions. So with those two pillars, CFD and PPA hand in hand and credit support, we look at potentially doubling, tripling the size of the PPA market. This gives the necessary liquidity and the rest hopefully should be following. Yeah, that, that's obviously huge potential growth there. But if I can just touch on a couple of those points there, then, Luca, or maybe all three that you mentioned, but the CFDs or contracts for difference and, and the, the two-way CFDs, that basically prevents these runaway windfall profits. And in a sense, is that, that's right, which, which the politicians have been very wary of and have, have stepped in to, to try and regulate or stop um, or, or tax even. You know. uh, absolutely. And it's, it's a sensible, uh, understandable uh, policy measure. And it gives actually certainty in revenues to the investors, what they actually looked for. 
but also on the other side for the government that proposes this. And it's absolutely fair to say. I think the retroactive uh, revenue caps, th that's more of a problem uh, because of the retroactive nature that you change the rules of the game. But uh, I think maybe out of th that has been a good learning. Uh, um, and I think that's what follows through. Absolutely. In terms of the credit support schemes, could you give some examples? How, how, what are these kind of facilities and how do they work? Well, it's not specified out. Uh, so there is now two years uh, to go down the road, further discussions. Uh, it's also for the member states uh, to figure out. I just want to show that there are very well established market-based ways to go and i think what we just know how it works in norway or what was recently demonstrated in spain this is a perfect system how does that work basically you have a a seller and a, a buyer both in a country so it has to be certain qualification criteria maybe it has to be energy intensive industry in that particular price zone and they can go to this uh, agency and they can say hey we have this contract we would like to insure 10 euro in credit support or 20 euro. And this agency will basically look at it, evaluate it and ask for a premium to pay for that. And the more participate in that, the more they can actually arrange kind of an insurance market. And this has worked very well in Norway. I think that's probably something which is in the mind of the, the legis legislator, how this could be potentially put up. But hey, Richard, this is not set out yet. Uh, this can be organized in different ways. You could think of uh, investment banks uh, trying to create the markets together with uh, other lenders uh, to be seen. But I think it's I think the putting the fingers in the right spot. What it would take to accelerate the the energy transition. Absolutely, that's what we all um, that, that's what we all want. But I think you know it, it, this would be. A way or several ways these are the kind kinds of ways that we want to bring in the smaller companies right that may maybe potentially would find financing quite difficult you bring up the, a very good point on the smaller company so uh, there are two aspects to that so first of all most companies don't have a credit rating uh, then actually sec that's one thing then the second thing is securing credit comes at the cost and there's not yet or in many markets there is not a private market offering to serve that. So here this, the government, the state can step in and help to uh, enable the market to work. Now, then regarding the smaller sized companies, there's also a transaction cost problem, but this will be solved. I mean, there's so many great startups, scale up software companies out there. You see startups like Real in, in Denmark, Trava in Germany. You see other platforms that actually will help to solve this transaction cost problem. But also there right now, typically one of the stumbling blocks is credit. So this will be sorted out by the market, uh, I believe very much as long as there is an enabling environment, which it very much looks so that the consensus in the European Commission is is to go that way. Uh, could you see, you know, a space where more utilities could come in and warehouse that for, for smaller smaller firms? Absolutely. I mean, there is a very important and big role to play uh, for the utilities. Uh, I don't see it so much in credit. Uh, I see it very much in, um, we call it at Pexa Park, the rise of the three-partite uh, PPA. So uh, most assets, renewable assets, which are going to be built in the future will be co-located with batteries because uh, it's just a way to go with increasing penetration. You have higher cannibalization and batteries help to mitigate this. Now, someone needs to be professional to manage uh, this profile risk, the balancing risk, how to shape it. And that's typically not the corporate and not the uh, seller. So there is a huge role for an intermediary to optimize, provide risk enhancing services, and there will be a big role and I think it's actually also good, it's complementary because a lot of people say, ah, we, we, we cherish the rise of corporate PPA and uh, that there is less on the utility PPA. I think that's the wrong way to see it. I think overall the market will be much bigger. It will need, it will need both parties and the utilities will have a very big role in, in this intermediary space. I mean, that's absolutely crucial. And what you say here, the, the, 
you know, the, the renewable power generation plus the storage, whether it be batteries or other ways, and then managing that whole portfolio Absolutely. is where, where pe there's a lot of potential here, isn't there? Uh, I'll come back to the role, uh, the, the, the issue of cannibalization, because there's a, a couple of interesting um, uh, aspects that I'd like to discuss with you, Luca. But, you know, back to your, you know, when you say that there's a golden age, I mean, where are the real hot markets, do you think, that, that will be really kind of, um, that you expect to really expand this year? I mean, I'm talking at the countries in particular, geographical areas. Yeah, I mean, the, the evergreens are Spain. I don't need to, to mention this. They have been leading the pack thanks to solar. Uh, Germany is hot and upcoming. Um, and we see just a huge play emerging in the offshore space. It will take uh, a bit time, but all the North Sea countries, so in, in particular Germany, uh, the England, uh, Denmark, uh, but also the Netherlands, you will see tremendous opportunities and build out. Then in the in the east, I think Poland, a very strong market, uh, both onshore, but also in the future offshore. These are the key markets in terms of volume. But the PPA wave is spreading everywhere. I mean, you, you have uh, PPAs done in the Baltics, uh, you have PPA done in, in southeastern Europe, but in sheer volume, it's just uh, Germany, just in terms of volume accounts for probably 10 Eastern, Southeastern European markets. So it gravitates there also from a, from a liquidity point of view. Absolutely. And are there any sort of areas or countries or regions even where you are a little bit concerned, where the pace has been a little bit too slow or where things are, you know, are, are reducing, where volume is going down? Well, we have everywhere permitting issues. Um, so it's a bottle, that's the key bottleneck. I mean, that's... You can count financing costs, you can count low liquidity, you can count low p prices. I mean, if there would be permit, the assets would be realized. So this is the main bottleneck uh, and it, it's related one-to-one -to, -one to grid build-out. So this will be the defining factor. Uh, next to everything which we talked is actually, we haven't talked about the fundament is, uh, are we building out the grids to ensure also more 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 connections absolutely i mean we hear this this constantly from from market participants and companies out there that it's the permitting that's the, that's the major and the red tape um overcoming local opposition uh all, all these factors are, are going to be crucial going forward are they not yeah. um uh, luca you mentioned um you know i think um you mentioned new markets such as Poland. How about France? Uh, what's happening here? Yeah, they just had a so incredibly attractive uh, feed-in uh, until now, which bet the PPA market. They have a highly regulated industrial price, uh, which can be accessed by a certain class of industrials. These were two factors hampering um, the PPA growth. There is now a big rush in France as developers are allowed to um, opt out of their auctions for 18 months, which created a short-term PPA market. But yes, uh, that due to those two factors, the, the market structurally doesn't allow a much bigger uptake and growth in, in, in the private market PPA. And, and you mentioned cannibalization. Um, now, we, we've seen in certain, certain markets, the Netherlands, uh, the Nordics, Germany, and instances of very high renewables output um, uh, and then lower demand which also turns prices negative um, it, it, what what kind of an impact is that having on on, on the growth of PPAs or, or in, in, in people signing PPA deals is this is it a concern or you know is is there something that okay we look at different solutions yeah it's I mean it's next to the it's not just the golden age of the PPA uh, it's actually the golden age of the hybrid PPA. Now, that doesn't sound so sexy as uh, uh, without hybrid, but look, 50% of new asset investments permitted in the UK are co-located. And this is spreading like a wildfire because of the higher penetration we have. So uh, the market is now figuring out standards for hybrid PPAs because uh, a co-located asset commands a premium and it will be hard to imagine going down a few years down the road where we will having assets realized without batteries. So this is the, the key next step in the evolution of the PPA market that most of the PPAs will be 
every PPS were under underneath you have a, a, a battery as well. So, and then the the opposite or the converse is also true to some extent, isn't it? Where you have uh, the instances of a lack of wind and a lack of sun, and but you've you've got a pay, base load PPA, and this is this has obviously been quite problematic when you've had very high prices. Yeah, absolutely, batteries work in in both ways. If there is a surplus and uh, and excess, and then we shouldn't forget that also the um, the the grid acts as a as a big battery, and uh, then there is the long duration storage, which I call H two. So this will take a few years uh, to realize, uh, but even if only 20% of uh, the announced uh, investments will be realized, we will see uh, an improvement in the, in, the, in the shortest of flex, which we have. It's needless to say the markets are structurally short in f- flexible capacity. This is, on the upside, the tremendous value uh, battery spring, just if you look at from an investment case and also tremendous value of building more interconnections. So we actually know what we need to do uh, up to 2030 uh, to to smooth this transition, but there will be wobbles. I mean, uh, it's going all much faster than we think. Every projection on solar is outdated when it is published uh, just because of the cost effect. The same uh, on batteries, it is very resilient. So this is actually very encouraging, but uh, I'm absolutely clear we will see wobbles. Uh, we will see people needing to step back to reassess. But the way to go is is, is super clear what we would need to do. And in, in terms of hydrogen then, when, when do you expect uh, this sort of demand to hit the, the, the PPA uh, market? Good question. Uh, I, I see a very strong case uh, for hydrogen. Uh, we currently lack the green supply even with the exemptions now granted. Um, so it will take the, the full build out of the North Sea. So it might all be delayed by two, three, four years uh, until we have more green uh, power supply to power those uh, electrolyzers. And then they can play their role. And one of the big role is really also this this storage element because they, they, they can s- swap and take in power, uh, excess power as well. Uh, but this is, we're not yet at scaling. I mean, when you look at the biggest electrolyzers so far realized, uh, we're talking five, 20 megawatts, and the projects we're looking at are one gigawatt. But there will be a learning curve, it will come, but there is a lack of green supply. I mean, uh, we're trying to contract uh, 1% of German supply, just green right now from Pexa Park in Germany, there is no lack of demand. I mean, pe- people just on the industrial side, I think that that's the first thing we need to focus on. Uh, the, how can we build up um, the supply? How can we uh, go there? I think everything is going into that direction. It just takes time. Yeah, yeah. It is a, it's a structural change. Yeah, and it, it's important to keep that momentum going in, in many ways. Um, a final question for you, Luca. We've seen, obviously, geo prices at the moment, guarantees of origin prices, uh, being at a completely level, different level from what they were, you know, even two years ago when they're often uh, being priced in, in euro cents. So now they're, you know, close. They were, they have hit close to double figures. But um, what kind of an impact are these prices? These are obviously now suddenly a very significant part of any PPA deal. So how how are how are you know both off-takers developers uh, dealing with these very high high price scenarios? Well, uh, I mean a PPA always had three commercial elements. You had uh, the power, you you had the balancing, and you had uh, the the guarantees of origin. Uh, now, if you look at it from this. Uh, Overall picture from a sell side, the increase in the geo prices is a bit offset in many markets by the increase in balancing cost. So it is not a net gain. Also, when you look at the relation of geo prices towards power prices, this has improved. It's a nice top up, uh, but in most markets, it it is offset by an increase in the balancing cost. Okay, yeah, yeah, but, and that's obviously also part of the energy transition and the, the 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 role of intermittency in the system as a whole. Luca, thank you very much indeed for being a a, a guest on the Monta Weekly Podcast. Thank you, Richard. Always a pleasure.
So listeners, you can now follow the podcast on our own Twitter account, aptly named the Montel Weekly Podcast. Please direct message any suggestions, questions, or, you know, let us know if you, if you think you have a good idea for a guest on the show. You can also send us an email to podcast at montelnews.com. Lastly, remember to keep up to date with all that's happening in energy markets on Montel News. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts and Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. Thank you and goodbye. Goodbye.